Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Harold Holzer, and we are thrilled to have you all here for a town hall discussion of Memphis police accountability and how we can advocate for change. A propitious moment to do it the day, the morning after practically the State of the Union when the president um, made a point of including police reform in the national agenda. And, and what better stage to begin the morning after discussion? Um, I like to say that we've had so many extraordinary change makers over the years on this stage since Roosevelt House went from the one-time home of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, as I know you all know was the case, to a public policy institute. Um, who has been here? Uh, Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton on this stage, uh, Jerry Nadler, Carolyn Maloney, Dick Durbin, uh, a, a public advocate named Bill de Blasio. I haven't gotten to you yet. <laughs> uh, the Dalai Lama, how is that for uh, name dropping? And, and Jumani Williams, who is here for a, an extraordinary debate, a speaker debate. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah, <laughs> quite a while ago. And authors like Bob Caro and um, Ta-Nehisi Coates and John Meacham, um, whose hand, by the way, I detected last night in the State of the Union address. Uh, inspiring policymakers. And today's event is in that tradition. Basil Smeichel, who I will introduce in a second, um, wrote a moving and practical commentary that I hope all of you read um, after um, Tyree was killed in Memphis. And he wrote, I often say that public policy is what government does to fix problems, but it's also what government chooses not to do. And one of the reasons for his pushing this dialogue is to make sure that there is no silence, that there is action. So welcome, Mr. Public Advocate, and welcome Calvin John Smiley, one of our favorite participants, and Professor Anna Ortega-Williams. We're so glad to have you. And now let me turn the proceedings over to the director of the Public Policy Program, Dr. Basil Smigel. Oh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to, you know, I do this. I'm going to say it again. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. All right, we are here to get things done, so I want your energy. Thank you so much for coming. Harold, thank you so much for your leadership. Uh, Jessica Duworth, who um, uh, partnered with us, she is the director of the Human Rights Program here. Um, and thank you so much for your partnership in, in this work and your continued friendship. Thank you so very much. I want to also thank uh, Aaron, Phil, Daniel, Peter, Bianca, Alexis, um, all the folks that are in the public policy program and that work for Roosevelt House that help put this together. The students, where are my students at? Hey guys, good to see you. Thank you so much for coming. God, man, let's give you a hand, thank you. And I often say, I often say in our classes that someday when, I, when I'm missing my social security check, I'm calling one of y'all uh, to figure out where it is. So we wanna train you to be out there and be good uh, public sector leaders. So bless you, the work that you do, and thank you so much for coming every day. Um, this is an important conversation, and I'm glad we have some extraordinary people to uh, help move this dialogue. Um, what we're gonna do, we're gonna uh, get to the public advocate in a second. What I do wanna do, though, is introduce the two members of the Hunter faculty that are here with us to um, have a conversation um, at the second half of our program. You're going to hear from Dr. Anna Ortega Williams. She is an assistant professor here. Her areas of expertise are historical trauma and systemic violence recovery among black youth, post-traumatic growth and social action, there is more, peer-led mental health and collective well-being approaches among youth, anti-oppressive and anti-racist social work practice, and youth development. We're happy to have you with us. Thank you so much. <laughs> By the way, I should say, in addition to her Fordham PhD and her MSW at Stony Brook, your BA was right here at Hunter College. Right. 
Dr. Calvin John Smiley received his PhD from the CUNY Graduate Center in 2014, and his work focuses on issues related to race, inequality, and social justice. More specifically, as a critical sociologist and criminologist, he has studied mass incarceration and prisoner reentry, particularly for urban inhabit inhabitants. He's published in a number of academic peer reviewed journals and book chapters, in addition to his research being cited in uh, the Washington Post, Le Mans, and many other uh, areas where you can read his perspective on these issues. And one of the things that I'm most proud of is that the very first event that I had here at Roosevelt House, you were a part of um, uh, on criminal justice reform and prison reform. So thank you for being not only in that work consistently, but you know, being such a friend to us. I also have to acknowledge Nick Smith, who is the deputy, deputy public advocate, deputy public advocate, who's here, who was, what's that? First deputy. First deputy. Sorry, I didn't mean to like generalize your, yeah, first deputy public advocate. He was here and joined us uh, with Dr. S Dr. Smiley for that very first conversation. So again, thank you for your leadership. But it, it does give me a, a, a great amount of pride and honor to, um, start this dialogue off with uh, the New York City public advocate, Jamani D. Williams. Just say a bit of, yeah, you can clap for that. <laughs> there are a lot of things that I can say about the public advocate. He, he did serve the New York City Council representing the 45th District, first generation Brooklynite. Where are people from? Grenada? <laughs> He's, he graduated from the public school system, overcoming the difficulties of Tourette's and ADHD to earn a master's degree from Brooklyn College. All right. He began his career as a community organizer at the Greater Flatbush Beacon School and later served as the executive director of the New York State, uh, of New York State Tenants and Neighbors, where he fought for truly affordable income targeted housing across the state of, state of New York, and he is actively involved in championing any legislation that can fundamentally change and transform New York City. The one thing that I will add from a personal note, the night he was elected to become public advocate of the city, he made a fantastic speech. But I think at the very end, for the last five or 10 minutes, when he talked about the importance of focusing on mental health, particularly of young black men, was one of the most powerful political moments of my career in the city of New York. And I thank you for that always. So if we can start this conversation, uh, and we welcome public advocate Jamani Williams. Jamani Dean. Uh, so uh, thank you so much, uh, public advocate. One of the things that are, and I, I wanted to start, there's so much um, happening right now, um, and certainly in the last few days, since we saw, or many of us saw the video of Tyree Nichols. We've also had, and I should say, the death of a an off-duty police officer here in New York City, Adid Fayez, as we think about him and his family. We also, as Harold uh, mentioned, the State of the Union address last night, where uh, the president talked, to, uh, had the family of Tyree Nichols, had his parents there, and talked about police reform, accountability, and restoring public trust. He talked about things like training um, and how that may affect um, the changes that we need. Um, and then today, I'm reading um, uh, some news clippings about an exodus from the 35-member Progressive Caucus of the City Council uh, because they are being asked to sign a document of list priorities. And among those priorities, it says, we will do everything we can to reduce the size and scope of the NYPD and the Department of Correction and prioritize and fund alternative safety in infrastructure that truly invests in our communities. And several members of that progressive caucus have said they did not want to sign uh, with that language. So with all that's going on, I, I wanted to keep that in mind and use that as context for how we begin this discussion. And just, you know, it's from the beginning, I, I saw the video. Did you have an opportunity to see the video? Did you want to see it? And what were your impressions about, about what you saw, what you heard? To, uh, I have not watched the video. I still haven't watched the George Floyd video, haven't watched the Mark Aubrey video. I realized that I was dealing with a, a lot of trauma, so I've decided at least for the time being I'm not going to watch those. Um, I, I get information, though, so I, I know what was on it. Uh, the news replays it, so sometimes I catch some stills, which are, which are difficult themselves. Um, I was 
I chose to try to see videos of, of him alive mm -hmm. and doing great things and, mm -hmm. and uh, awesome smile and skateboarding with family. So I was trying to show, uh, see him in life. But I do think it's important that that video is out. It has to be part of uh, the public uh, to, to see. But it just, I, I just I, I couldn't um, take it. Uh, but, you know, for me, I think um, I always want to set some context. I think what happens is we're often trying to tinker with stuff that I don't think is going to get us to where we want to go. So I always say, one, I, I always believe the system, everything's operating how we design to operate. It's not, it's not an accident. That's what makes it harder. Because it's working. It's, you know, if you, if you, if it's founding, not broken. <laughs> no, it's not broken. Yeah, yeah. If the founding fathers kind of woke up, they would say, I'm not sure why uh, black people are voting, why you had a black president, why are women voting, but otherwise, pretty good job of, <laughs> of, of pushing forward what it was that we put forth. And so I think we have to identify that, because then we know we're not, we're not, we're not really trying to reform. Like, we, we're trying to put something new that has never been there. And I think it's important to understand that. And when it comes to policing, you know, folks don't want to have an honest conversation about policing, this history of policing. And, and the, the biggest, like, I, I, actually, I was surprised at how much I liked Biden's speech. You know, I'm not the biggest, whatever. But uh, <laughs> I was, it was like, oh, he came to play. So it was, it was a pretty good speech, actually. The strongest point around, around the stuff that was said for me was when he was saying something that I've been saying for a while times, we ask police to do too much. Mm. That is really important in so many ways, because if we can get to that, a lot of the other things start to melt away. We have to deal with transparency and accountability. That, that's, those are two buckets that we've never done anything well on. But how we use policing, who we use it for, how, when we're using it, and what we're trying to replace instead of it, is a key question. Uh, it's a very important question of what is public safety, and what do communities look like that are safe, that we deem safe, and what do the ones look like that we don't seem safe. They already have the most police, they already have the most incarceration. That doesn't mean that law enforcement doesn't have a role to play, but the communities that we deem safe normally have access to a lot of things, mm -hmm. uh, like mental health, like good schools, like more than potato chips to feed their kids, like uh, access to good jobs and quality housing. I always say that doesn't excuse bad behavior, but we have to look at what is it that is a safe community and what is not a safe community. And once we can really address that, I think we'll do leaps and bounds because it's not about reforms. Reforms would have worked. It's not about retrainings. I want people to be trained. But those things in and of themselves are not going to get to the heart of the issue because the heart of the issue is how we use police in the country. And to that point about how we use them, I mean, it, did Memphis do anything right in the way in which they addressed this seemingly very quickly? after at least they saw the video, maybe they weren't gonna address it as quickly before they saw the video, but then saw it and realized this this is indefensible. Did Memphis do anything right uh, in your view? And, and with that, as you talk about what police should and should not do, it's clear that that scorpion unit that they had, um, which we've seen in New York in another iteration several times, um, is, not, is not the proper use of the police force. Um, should those folks have been fired immediately and indicted? The answer is yes. I always, I mean, I have to give acknowledgement. I always hate having to celebrate what should be done and should have been done. I always have to wonder if it would have been done if they were white officers, if it would have happened that quickly. Um, that I would probably lean toward probably not. Um, but it also goes to show, and this is important in politics and others, that simply replacing white folks with folks with more melanin in their skin, um, which I think is important, doesn't solve the problem either. <laughs> so if you're gonna replace folks in a power structure that are gonna continue the same structure, then you, I don't know what you've done. I mean, I, uh, it is important to see yourself in power situations, so I always grant that. But if you're not gonna change it, then, then what you're gonna have is this. Are we still fighting against that in New York City? Because that's, that's culture, that's departmental culture, peer pressure, whatever you want to call it. And then of course, the structure that was you know, problematic from the beginning. But we, you know, in New York City, there's been a lot of conversation around having more diversity around, among patrolmen, for example, but you can also see that there's very little diversity among leadership. Um, so is there something in, in what, what's happening in NYPD that's starting to address these issues, or are we still muddling through? So it is hard to have conversation about public safety and policing when crime is going down. Mm. 
it's even harder when it's going up. And so those conversations, while we have to have them become more difficult, because what happens is f using fear is very effective, especially for people running for office. Mm. Uh, and people are afraid, many times rightfully so. And we have to be clear that it's, you want people to be safe and to feel safe. You could actually be very, very safe and not feel safe, and that could be almost just as dangerous. And so we haven't done a good job sometimes about talking about both of those things. And I will say Democrats are terrible when it comes about talking to public safety. Horrible. And because we don't know how to do it, we're either ignoring it or we're using Republican talking points. Republicans are better at their own talking points. That's another, another conversation. But uh, we have to do better when it comes to public safety. And there is a way to address the things I'm saying while acknowledging that real people are dying, like real people are being harmed. The problem is we have continually... Like folks will say, you know, but these, these communities, they're asking for more police, they want police. And I was like, that's true. One, we've been trained to think that that's what's going to solve the problem. But two, they've also been asking for more housing. <laughs> they've also been asking for some better jobs. They've also asked for uh, guidance counselors in the schools. You didn't hear that? Nobody heard those? All you heard was the police one? And so it's the framing that becomes really important. Communities know what they want and need, actually. But we only respond to the incarceral and the law enforcement part with all of the money. But that's an important point, because it, what does get lost is that communities are not passive in advocating for the things that they want and care about, because they, they have a great understanding of how government and the system works, for them or against them, right? It's 100% it's true. The, this administration, by the way, and they were probably surprised, they did a survey about public safety. What should we do about public safety? The first two things were mental health and housing. <laughs> Law enforcement came third. <laughs> like, people know what it is that we need. We just don't get what we need. And so right now, the city budget, the executive budget came out and has cuts for every single agency. Department of Mental Health, Department of Education, uh, 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 Children's Services. Every agency is facing a cut, except for uniform offices, which includes NYPD. And mm -hmm. uh, they have access to, not only do they already have access to unlimited overtime, the executive budget on the state, they didn't talk about restoring any budget cuts being faced by other agencies. They said, we're going to give some more money for NYPD for overtime. <laughs> and I always look at like this. The NYPD is an agency. They might need access to overtime. But what can the Department of Mental Health do with access to the same the overtime? Same, yeah. Like, why is it that we are viewing public safety one way, and it's hard to change because people are afraid, but you have to have leadership to do it? Because we have seen, I always, I don't, I, let me ask Chris, I don't know how, what the ages are. But uh, maybe 25 to 30 years. Anybody who's 20 to 20 to 35, when you were younger, how many have known somebody who was shot? <laughs> Anybody 40 and above, have you known somebody who was shot? Okay. The answer to this question can't be arresting the people or the children we arrested 20 years ago, yeah. because those questions shouldn't be answered the same. At some point, one of the generations should be like, I didn't know this. <laughs> but it's not working. So we arrested the we arrested some children 20 years ago to stop the violence. 20 years later, there's still more violence. Like it's not, it's just, just the arresting doesn't work. Just the incarceration doesn't work. That doesn't mean a law enforcement has a role to play and there's an important role. They're used, I think, best when there's an acute problem. We have to, like if there's something happening right now, all of us are running and we're going to want the police to run to the danger, and we're going to say, if you don't run to the danger fast enough, you didn't do your job. So I'm very aware, but we've been using them not for acute problems, for very complex problems. Anything that we can't solve, stole the police at. You know, it's, it's important that you raise this issue of leadership, too, and how we talk about it, because I remember David Dinkins came in talking about being tough on crime, and he saved streets, saved city, 6,000 more cops, but part of that was also community policing. He had beacon school programs. He funded libraries. There was a different, it was not only approach to crime, but it was also an approach to reducing anything that might turn you into a, a criminal. Um, this was a front end and the back end, and we, that seems to be lost in the conversation. And Julian took a lot of credit for Dinkins. Yeah, the, um, by the <laughs> way, David Dinkins was a member of the Democratic Socialists of America. Uh-oh. 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 <laughs> uh -oh. yes, I got a duck on that one. It's an academic. I'm not a Democrat in here. I'm a professor. <laughs> I'm just saying, a lot of the folks that we lift up, like, yeah. somehow these words became yeah. dirty words. I don't yeah. know. 
I mean, that's, a, that's another conversation. Yeah. Uh, I think once folks got into the power structure, they wanted to continue things that I think we should be pulling back from. I'll come back for another discussion on that one. Sure, sure, uh, no but problem. yeah, he, I mean, he did He did have more cops, but he did open the Beacon School. One of my first jobs was at a Beacon School. He did try to do a balanced approach. Um, we say some of those things now, but the problem is that infrastructure, let's take mental health for, for instance. The infrastructure of to provide continuum of care for someone who can't afford to, to pay into a continuum of care is a hard infrastructure to develop and to talk about. So we just send police. What we're gonna do is send police. And that, like, the, the thing with, with that, like an officer may be necessary, but the officer is not necessary at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And just having an officer does not provide a continuum of care, just putting someone in a hospital and not figuring out how they're gonna get to get the continuum of care is not gonna solve the problem because they're gonna just recycle. And so while this is a complicated, if we all took some time to really flesh it out, I think we could but it is easier to lean on the NYPD. By the way, it's not fair for the officer who actually doesn't have the tools to solve those problems. When they use the tools that they get, they have, they're gonna get in trouble. You talked should. about that, you said that sort of scaling back on what they're being asked to do. So what, what do you think is that sort of guideline or boundary? Well, if someone has a mental health crisis and the Department of Mental Health doesn't have the, the funding needed to provide that, they actually should have the funding. Yeah. We shouldn't give more funding to the police to do that. We actually fund police to do a lot of youth programs, which is fine, but there's two things that you young people seem to hate, adults and police. <laughs> and those are the two folks that do the most youth program. So we should probably fund something else that can engage the young folks so they can start doing their own things. But that's a hard concept sometimes for people to adopt because we always tend to just lean back the police, like we kind of, oh, just get the police like, like, like do that. And it's, it's a difficult conversation. But I always say, think of a community that you deem safe right now. No one is gonna think of the communities that have the most police in it right now. We just don't. That's, and it's unsafe, even with the police there. With the communities that we deem safe look a lot different. And we know that. And what are we doing like, to, to fix it? And even, so there, was a, there was a takedown in Washington Heights. They, they made an arrest of a bunch of folks to say there was some violence there. And I'm like, okay, that might be a necessary thing. You probably were there five years ago and you'll probably be there five years from now. Yeah. So how many times are you gonna do a takedown without changing something in that environment that's creating this to ha for happening? It's interesting to say that because we're in one of the wealthiest communities in the country. If you ever walk through this neighborhood, how many doctor's offices uh, are around? Um, so ex exactly that point. Now, oh, by the way, we put out a, a, a report, was it October? November, October, on gun violence. We put out gun violence uh, report. We did a mapping of where the hotspots are. Mm -hmm. The hotspots had the most incidents of COVID and COVID deaths. Mm -hmm. They had the least uh, vaccine. They had the most incidents of uh, mental health calls. They had the least uh, affordable housing. They had the most school absences. So there was a cadre of data sets that traveled with the gun violence. And we actually released that report and had council members from all across the country because the data sets look the same in all of those communities. Now again, I, I'm never gonna accuse somebody shooting up the block, like that's a problem. There has to be accountability for that, but it's not moral to just focus on the accountability and the, same, the, the incarcerate and the, the, the police without actually trying to do something to change so that we can have a, a different outcome in the first place. Let me focus on accountability for just two seconds because Joe Biden talked about it a little bit last night and mind you, he's just talking about federal police officers. He's not talking about anything. He has really no control over what happens state and, state and local. We have over 18,000 law enforcement agencies in this country. So in trying to think about what accountability looks like across 18,000 agencies um, and, and thinking about what we do here in New York with CCRB, they just released a report um, condemning some members of the police department for their behavior in the protest after George Floyd. Um, do the agencies that we have to hold the cops more accountable, to hold the whole system more accountable, do they have the teeth, the no. authority to do the work? No. Yeah. The answer is no. And every time we try to put another layer, everybody says we have uh, all these other things, but they're not actually working. And so what we need to be able to do is so it's two things, right? There's always just, there's bad apples mm -hmm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. So I got that. One, 
we're not doing anything to take the bad apples out. And that makes the whole department look bad when there's actually a lot of folks who are going there who came and said, I want to do this job because I want to help people. But the bad apples uh, hurt. Then just systemically, forget about bad apples, the way we're using police are going to put police officers in very bad situations that they don't have the tools to fix. And there's no way that that report should come out and there was not more discipline uh, that should have been happened. And some people just shouldn't be police officers. Mm. Like, there's, there, that's a thing. There's some people that shouldn't be police officers. Um, uh, by the way, there's a lot of police that will think some of the discipline is too much, so we want we to talk <laughs> about it as well. But um, we don't have, you know, every discipline goes right back to the commissioner. That's a problem. The commissioner shouldn't probably not be able to veto all the things that are, that are put out before. Uh, so that's, that's a huge problem. Um, transparency and, dis and accountability are two big things. But again, like, like you talk about um, the way they talk about no snitching on the street, mm -hmm. which uh, we, we, there's a bad definition of snitching that I think, you know, if a grandmother sees someone's head got blown off, she's not snitching. She's, she's trying to use her, the resources her taxpayer pay for. If you was a part of a crime and got caught and told your partner, that's probably snitching. But, <laughs> but, yeah, but we, we, we kind of confuse it. But they have the blue wall of silence, yeah. and they pretend like that's somehow different than snitching on the street. Like, so we, we somehow talk about these communities less human-like right, when right. they're doing things that human beings do. But right. um, I don't think we have the mechanisms in place right now to have the kind of accountability that we would need. Um, we've seen people get killed. We, what was, one of the things that struck out me, there was one of the things that was substantiated, it was like 24, I think, instances of people lying these are police officers who are substantiated to have been lying. That means they lied on a report. They lied on something. If you're lying, that's like that should be huge flag. Right, right. And like it just goes. But there's away. no, and then it goes away. There's no discipline at the end. If you had to, I mean, crystal ball, magic wand. What's your what's break down the system completely, tear it apart, start over? Um, could we do that? I don't know if we could. So. Capitalism is the best pyramid scheme I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> and for, for capitalism to work, you got to have a lot of people at the bottom. Yeah. I think melanin is easily identifiable <laughs> to where it belongs. So I, I, you know, I'm, I have a big problem with American capitalism. I think that's a structure that we have to, have to deal with in terms of equity. I do think we can push, continue pushing in the right direction. But whenever we do that, we have violent resistance. <laughs> Because this whole system is built on inequity. And if you start fixing that inequity, that feels, can I say fucked up? I don't know. Sure. So I, <laughs> that feels fucked up for the people who have been benefiting from the privilege for such a long time. And by the way, nobody is, like people, and when I have these conversations, I'm like people think, sometimes think uh, someone's being, calling them a racist. And I'm like, no. First, you might be, I don't know. <laughs> Second. It's not that. Nobody is responsible for the system we have now, because we weren't born. We were born into the system. So I don't, nobody's responsible. I'm not, I don't have to be uh, transphobic to have helped push a system that's based on transphobic. I don't have to be misogynist to push forward a system that's based on misogyny. You don't necessarily have to be racist. You could be, but you don't have to be to help push forward a system um, that's based on racism. But what it is is what we do to try to get the system out, because we were, we, weren't, we were born into this. Our responsibility is what system we give to the next generation. And I think it's important to say that so people can sometimes immediately get defensive because they're like, ah, not this and that. Yeah, but like, the question is, can you recognize the system that we're in? And, and to your question, like, these words trip people up all the time. Like, you, you heard people in the streets defund the police. So everybody went to the side. I don't want to defund the police. No, I'm like, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why are we, as leaders, spending time arguing with people in the streets who are expressing their pain about something? Why don't we take that pain and turn it into something that's workable? Also, I think we should all dream of a country or a space where you don't need armed people mm -hmm. for protection. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, why is that not a beautiful dream? <laughs> and what you're saying is we can't even dream about that? <laughs> you should be able to dream about that. Right. I'm going to be real, we're not there yet. And I don't think we're going to be here in, there in a while. But you're saying we can't even aim for that? Just mentioning that dream is a problem? Because if we're not aiming for that, that that's a problem. So we should all be aiming for that while recognizing the reality of where we're in. Right. So we get caught up in these 
words and these names because it's usually beneficial if we're running for office. Okay. As you talk about the next generation, uh, before you get out of here, I'd like to, if you don't mind, I'd like one, a student, if they have a question. Is there any student that has a question? Student. Oh, one of my students. That's it. Uh, hi, thanks so much for coming today to come speak to us. Um, you just mentioned that we should dream about a country that doesn't have to arm people in the streets in order to protect themselves, right? Um, I think some of the things that we've been thinking about recently have been the shootings at Montserrat Park, Half Moon Bay, and of course what, um, what happened with Tyree Nichols. Um, how do you imagine we get there? How do you imagine we get to a place where people don't just, uh, can't just buy a gun with a driver's license and don't just go around being able to commit a violent acts all over? So, you know, actually, I think when I came, when, well, folks who do know me, when I came to start being known a little bit around some of the police work we're doing about the abuse of stop, question, and frisk, what I'm most excited about is the work I've done around gun violence. Um, at the same time I was doing that, I co-chaired a task force to combat gun violence. And we did a lot of good work. One, there's two parts of the gun violence. So one, we have a demonic obsession with guns in this mm -hmm. country. We just do, and it's a whole other conversation, but it stems from one of the best ad campaigns that this country has ever seen to try to get people to buy a product that was fading out. And they attach it to being American, Americana, and it just, it just took off. But um, the, we're 4% of the world's population. We own 50% of all civilian-owned guns in the world. That's, that's how much guns are in, in the hands of Americans, and a small part of Americans. Um, so one is the supply of guns that are coming in to, to cities. Like we just, Congress just has to, I mean, it's just, they're not even, they don't even support the things that most Americans support because the NRA, which actually was about gun safety, has become this other thing that is the head of the demon, trying to tell folks don't do something as basic as having a lockbox if you have children, in, like anything that stems guns, they want you to be able to buy bazookas, basically. Um, so that, if Congress would act, we could stem the flow of guns that are coming in. Officers actually are, are making sometimes historic numbers of arrests and getting guns off the street, and we're still getting more in. They're just coming, just coming. So that's part one. The second part is the demand for guns, for demand for the use of violence to communicate. That's something I think local governments can do much better at, so that even if these guns are in the street, our young people don't have to pick it up and communicate. And they are very often, they're using permanent solutions for very temporary problems. And so we have to find a way to unpack that. Um, so one of the things that we did with the Gun Violence Ta Task Force, we actually had a pilot program of $5 million. It's actually grown to $100 million, which is awesome now. Um, but where we had these programs, violence dropped uh, even faster in those communities. And so when we were dealing with the abuse of stop, question, first, it was interesting because they told me the sky was going to fall, it was going to crack open, all the black and brown people were going to go crazy. And we said, <laughs> no, that's not going to happen. But what we saw actually from 2011, 2012, when we dealt with some of the abuses, when we funded these programs, in 2018, we became the safest city we ever were, ever, that, that ever happened. Like, and we were telling people that, and they didn't want to believe it. And so it's funny to me now when I hear people talk about 2018, they're like, look how safe it was. Like, yeah, I was telling you that. It was, it was safe back in 2018. Uh, but they're using the same, the same things then that, that they want to use now when it comes to like bail, when it comes to like discovery. And I'm like, you know, violence has increased across the country. That wasn't our bail laws. I got nothing to do with us. Um, but that's, a, that's another conversation. But, so, but to your answer, we have to expand some of the work that we've been doing. Um, and what happens is there's, there's this push to over police. Black and brown communities is always there. So you can have a pandemic that takes over the entire world and you see a global increase in violence, a national increase in violence. No one wants to pretend that that's it. They want to just say black and brown people are acting crazy again and shove more police on it. So we have to have leaders and electeds with the courage to walk people through a real plan of public safety. Part of the problem is that that's hard to do in a debate. Okay. You can't do that in 60 seconds. And so the sound bites get lasted. But what I can tell you now, from speaking to people all over the state, even folks that disagree with me, they are ready for a public safety plan and they want to be walked through it. You just have to have the right leaders to have the courage to do that because it's a difficult conversation. All right, three quick lightning round questions that will get you out of here first. Are we thinking and talking about bail reform wrong? Of course we are. Yeah. I mean, because it's been propped up as the thing that's keeping you away from safety. 
So now if you ask somebody on the street, should we do payroll from here because I want to be safe? If you, if you tell them what are the numbers, they have no idea. And it, what frustrates me is we often are using um, uh, cases that have nothing to do with bail reform at all and it's most salacious cases in, in the city to talk about bail reform. Like, bail just means you should come back to court and that's happened. And the changes of people who are getting re uh, who, who are getting rearrested on bail hasn't really changed that much. And so that's not what the answer is. Actually, I would focus on speedy trial. Mm. If, if that's what I could focus on, let's get people in and out so they can get home or go where they're going. But they're languishing now in Rikers waiting for their their sentence or waiting for their for their day in court. So it's absolutely the wrong thing. And actually, when it comes to bail, even discovery, um, like discovery, we're catching up to where other people already are. Yeah. And so when judges use uh, discretion, I'm like, yeah, but the places where judges use discretion have more violence than us. So I don't know why we want to copy other folks. We should look about what's working here. We also have to have that conversation while acknowledging that human beings are being shot, and, and that's a problem. Um, and at last, like, so you mentioned uh, Officer Faez. One of the things that they said, which is true, like this person had a, uh, a, a history of being arrested 22 times. Yeah. And so sometimes they use that to go about bail and discovery. Right. But I'm like, you know, most of those arrests happened before bail. <laughs> and so there was a problem with the system before, before. That, that had nothing to do with the changes that we made. Right. So the second to last question. Um, you mentioned stop, question, frisk. We've heard it come, we've heard it being talked about again once we thought it went away in the return of the anti crime unit. What's the danger of a lot of stuff that we thought we got rid of, we thought we did away with coming back and being used as uh, the rationale being that we need to fight crime and, uh, again and be, be stronger again? The, the, the sort of mission creep, it creeps back into the conversation, into the policy. So, um, stop, question, and frisk is a tool that officers actually need to do their job. You need to be able to stop someone if you have reasonable suspicion and first search a probable cause. That tool is being used all across, probably everywhere in the world. Like, if you're an officer, you gotta be able to, well, but what was happening is that was attached to a number. And so now they were just making arrests so they can reach their quotas, and if they happen to find a weapon, then they can say, oh look, this is working. They actually found more weapons off of the white stops than the black and brown stops, they just were stopping more black and brown people. They actually stopped more young black men than live in the city of New York. And so I always make sure I talk about the abuses of stop, question, and frisk, because I had captains that were so scared, oh, I'm not doing any stops. Oh, okay, were there stops to make, or are you just not doing it? Like, I don't, there's no magic number. Like, either it was a reasonable suspicion, or there wasn't. And that's all you have to use. What happens is when people are afraid, elected and people who are running for office get to use that fear mm. to push policies that are harmful to the community in the guise of being safe. There has never been a correlation between uh, much more funding going to police and safety. Matter of fact, by the way, you know, NYPD was never cut. Like the, the police department, never, the only thing that's been defunded are all the other agencies who have been cut. And so like, they, I just don't understand this. We should be able to have a real conversation about numbers, about what's happening. NYPD is an agency. I want them to get what they need so they can provide services. But if you have all of the money and everybody else is getting cut, then, you know, then we, we, ha we have an issue and we have a problem. So when we have a problem that we can't fix, we try to creep in with aggressive over-policing to solve that problem and often causes other problems. We'll get you out of here on this last question uh, before we hear from our, our, our professors and faculty members here. Um, there's one subject that I hear, that I see you talk about just as much fervor as so many of the other uh, topics that you discuss. And we're gonna get you out of here on a lighter note. You're one of the biggest Knicks fans that I know. <laughs> How are they doing? So, I'm going to tell you how bad <laughs> Nick's fandom is a terrible disease. <laughs> like, the owner is a Trump supporter, and I'm still in it. Like, that's, that tells you how bad it is. And they're not the most winningest team. Yeah, so, right. if you're a Knicks fan, I, I tried to, you know, I'm Brooklyn to the, to the bone, so I tried to switch to the Nets on my Xbox. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. <laughs> I couldn't do it. I'm very proud of where we are right now as a team. Uh, they just, they got a couple win streaks going on. They, um, they're doing all right. I'm just worried that they might try to trade away the whole team. Yeah. We got to let the whole, we got to let there's a couple people. I think, you know, we, we could let them go <laughs> right now and get some good. But I think, we're, I, think we're doing all, I think we're doing okay. All right. Thank, Thank you, you, brother. Thank Peace you. Peace, everybody. Professors.
Thank you, thank you, thank you, public advocate. We really appreciate you stopping by, sir. Thank you. Thank you uh, for our uh, dear Hunter faculty members, um, I mean, you heard uh, you heard uh, the public advocate's comments. You heard Jamani's comments. And what are your what are your thoughts? First of all, did you all did you all we we talked about this as a sort of a reaction to Memphis? But did you see the video? Do you have thoughts on? The video, what happened, what you heard about it, and you know some of what uh, reflecting on what Jamani talked about. I didn't see the video. I want healing to go viral. Mm. Um, I could, I couldn't see one more video where someone's body was being dehumanized in that way or the attempt to dehumanize because we, our humanity is always intact. Well, yeah, and I'll say I did see the video and I saw the video of George Floyd and the video of Eric Garner. And I think for me, seeing the video is, is you know, it's part of a position I put myself in both professionally as someone who writes about this, talks about this, has people come to me about this, but also personally in the kind of activism I do, working with youth and working with other young folks who um, are also involved in violence themselves. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important to kind of be able to uh, see these videos for what they are. And that's not for me to say that everyone else should watch them. Uh, but also I think what's interesting too is that when these videos go viral is folks watch them in many ways for voyeurism, but there's also this kind of interesting mode of like, folks watch them to see, well, what could he have done differently, right? Mm -hmm. What could mm -hmm. Tyree done differently to give an excuse for those police who, who beat a man to death? Right, right, I mean. right. And you know, it's interesting, I did, I did watch the video for a lot of the same reasons uh, that you did, but, uh, but then I realized like it's affecting me. Like it got to a point where I realized it, this is affecting me and the thing that, one of the things that disturbed me, which doesn't get talked about as much as the, the, the actual beating, was this, the, 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 the parts where the police officers were standing around sort of talking about their conquest, if you will. This sort of warrior policing and them talking about it afterwards. I fully expected one of them to pull out a cigar. Um, but you know, in talking to the students afterwards and asking them if they had seen it, whatever, they mentioned some of the same issues that they didn't, you know, for whatever reason, they didn't want to see it. Does, is there a line between, is there something like tra trauma porn where we, that, that voyeurism, how real is that? And how do we not be complacent even if we're not watching it? I think, I think you summarize it right in that, in that note. We don't have to be trapped in the either or. We don't have to be trapped in the binary of did I watch it so that I can respond, so that I can fight for my humanity, so that I can transform how we love and how we dig deep to support every single neighbor who put out a candle. Mm. They didn't have to see that video because they knew when he skated past their home that he was there and now he isn't. And yeah, okay. Yeah, and I, I would just say that you know, we've always had this trauma porn in in American history. If you're black, or if you're brown, or if you're a marginalized community, you know, I think the the difference is that the the medium has changed. Mm -hmm. So if we were in the 19th century, uh, the Tyree Nichols video would have just been on a postcard of him being lynched. If this was the 20th century, it would have been on a grainy camcorder like it was of Rodney King. Mm -hmm. We just live in an era of social media where it's looped uh, in a different way. So I, I, I would say that would be my response to this. And what the public advocate talked about in terms of, the, as you talk about history and the history of the system of police, um, how do you fix something that's so inherently broken and so inherently not for us? You talk a lot about the, the abolitionist framework, and I, you know, talk a little bit more about that because it seems like he's speaking to exactly the same point. Yeah, I think I, you know, I was agreeing with most of what uh, public advocate uh, Jumani Williams was saying because it almost sounds like he he wants to say that, but obviously maybe because of the position he's in, he can't. But yes, I'm I'm of the political position of defund them to nothing, and uh, uh, I think, you know. That, that is a real conversation that can be had, and I think that's why defund became such a, a particular moment within a longer movement, because it was so practical, right? I think one of the criticisms or some of the reactionary criticisms to abolition throughout the years is that it's too pie in the sky, it's too utopian. How do we get there? 
Well, defund gives us a very clear roadmap. And the starting point is move money from here to somewhere else. And as we just as you talk about mental health and so on. Right. And yeah. as we just heard, you know, we'll hear every everyone from, you know, Pat Lynch, who's the union president, to our mayor, who's a former cop, talk about that defund is destroying police. But yet, as Jumani Williams just told us, they're the ones who are getting more money. Mm -hmm. Well, every other part of our social uh, a society in public sector is losing money. Mm -hmm. So, you know, defund them. You know, my stance is defund, defund, defund till they are not needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought it was uh, amazing that he said, why is it so difficult for us to dream of a society where nobody's carrying guns and we don't yeah, need police I wrote that guns? down. <laughs> I wrote that down. <laughs> I wanted to, he mentioned something else about, and he touched on this, the fact that these, uh, these officers were African American. I, you know, so many people came up to me and remarked about that that if we're talking to, if we're trying to convince African-American, Latino, pe people of color to join the police department to make it more diverse, the theory is that that diversity would make them more responsive to the communities that they're policing. But then we see this. So, so how, do, how do we talk to young men of color in particular about what they, about what they saw in these police officers? Well, one, I think it's important, just Jumani Williams also spoke about changing the power structure. Mm -hmm. We can't talk about change that's topical alone. We can't, like, and I would, I would concur that it's about defunding and it's about healing. How, because just because one agency has less money doesn't mean that we aren't going to still find another way to organize oppression. That continues, and it conti it's structural, it's systemic. And so I think if we're able to um, find a way where we're able to address the historical trauma, we're able to um, have an opportunity where we're able to, to be able to acknowledge the actual possibilities that we have, um, not just through the, the healing that we're doing, but also through the organizing that we're able to do. People are out and they're responding. That is a form of healing. That's when it's Tyree, it's also me. So it's that collective identity, that, that ability to acknowledge that there's a collective self that, that needs to be responded to. So we need the structural change and we need the healing. And, and one of the things that I thought, you know, as you're talking about this, I remember as a friend of mine who had asked me to talk to her young sons, who were teens at the time, and his friends. And one of his one of her sons kept talking to me about he was getting stopped a lot, as you hear about stop question phrase. He was getting stopped a lot. And he was getting so angry and he didn't know how to deal with his anger. And it just struck me that the the first thing that I had to say to him was, Brother, I need you to survive that moment. Mm -hmm. I need you to live. And it just it was and I hated to have to have that be my first response. But the reality is I needed that young black man to survive, um, to grow old. And you know, what are, are we ca we're all carrying that, I guess, at different ages, whether we're stopped or not. This, this question about, you know, can we grow old as young black men? And can I say this is also in the context, this is, my daughter read a book um, entitled Sulway. That's mm. banned right now in Florida. Yeah. So this conversation about police brutality is in the context of anti-critical race theory, it's in the context of banning books about black history, it's in the context of anti-trans le legislation, like there are more anti-trans bills that have been introduced since January of this year than all of last year combined. Wow. And so that kind of attack on our ability to live and to thrive, it, it's in that context and it's so important that we're able to critique that context and bring in the stories of our ancestors, the stories of how we've resisted that we resisted this annihilation and that we've been able to, um, we are not just stories of our wounds and our pain, we are also the evidence of intergenerational healing and well-being. Right, right. Does any student have a question? Student first, but any student have a question? Yes. You have a mic coming. Hi, um, I'm your student as well, Professor Smiley. I so. knew that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so it's kind of a two-parter because I've been trying to like figure out how to frame the question. Um, but I guess to both of you, do you think that accountability and justice can exist in a system like this? Um, and then also, I personally also believe in uh, police and prison abolition, but like I've heard a lot of people think that's unrealistic. Um, so I guess my other question is like, 
what ways or like how does that look like and what can that look like? I guess that's coming to me. All right, so the first part about accountability, I think absolutely accountability can be can be done through a whole host of ways that is not necessarily adversarial, right? Our system is set up in a way where if you're arrested and you go through the system, there's a winner and a loser, right? It's the state versus the defendant. And I think that we can look at other systems, uh, particularly when we think about um, indigenous communities and other places around uh, the globe, uh, and also in, 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 in local communities where they do much more of restorative or transformative type of circles or justice that tries to think about how do all parties come away uh, with a takeaway or uh, uh, holding one accountable and what that looks like. That could, that could have a whole myriad of, of examples uh, uh, whether it could be some kind of compensation, some type of um, work, uh, uh, coming to recognize community service. You know, we can think about those things, but sending someone to a space of violence, like a jail or prison, only exac exac exacerbates the problem. Uh, I do work at Rikers Island. That is not a place that anyone should be. Anyone. It's yeah. dirty, it's gross, it's, it smells bad. When it rains, literally it rains inside. Right, when I'm walking to the different halls, you literally are going through waterfalls. And we're talking about an old building that probably has asbestos, all of the types of stuff. So you're getting hit by that water. Uh, that's leaking into your cell. Who knows what you're breathing in? All those types of things. To the second question about uh, how do we get there, prison pr police abolition, I'm of the thinking that obviously this is a long-term goal. Right, So um, this is not something that's going to happen tomorrow because I said abolition. And so we have to work towards that. And part of what I find so inspiring around abolition is that it gives us the platform to reimagine what a society looks like. And that's not one dimensional. That's not two dimensional, right? We can literally think millions of different ways and not have to say we only have to find one. And when we do find whatever those are, we can say that might work for the next century, but then we may have to think about it again too, right? It's an ever uh, building process. And yeah, that might si uh, uh, sound again like pie in the sky, but I always take it back to the original abolitionists, which is the uh, abolition of slavery. If this was 1825 New York and slavery was still existing, uh, there might be people saying, oh, this is ridiculous. We're not, we're not getting rid of this institution, right? That was an mm -hmm. institution. Mm -hmm. And so it's the dreamers, it's the resilience, it's the perseverance that gets us to a point where as uh, public advocate Jumani Williams said, can we imagine a day where we don't have to have armed people in the streets? And to go back to some of the folks who are in the communities that are carrying guns, uh, not everybody who's in our communities who are carrying guns are doing it because they wanna be violent. Some of them are doing that because they want to protect themselves and they know they can't go to the police and that there are other people who are gonna be out here harming them and so they're protecting themselves. So we have to remember that, you know, we don't live in Gotham City, Gotham City or, you know, uh, uh, that kind of thing. And I just wanna to add to, you said, is it realistic? I would say, don't ask us. Like, it, it is so important that you are turning and asking your, your generation and generations that are to come, like, is it, what is possible? Is that realistic, the dream that we are imagining? Because we have so many chains on our imagination, like my colleague was saying, about what we can imagine is even possible. So I think it's just important that we're able to begin there. Um, and I also think accountability has to be reimagined and justice. Because we often leave the conversation about accountability outside of our own hands. Communities understand what it means to have accountability and, and what would actual justice mean. It might mean repair. It might mean restitution. It might mean reparations. So I think it's really important that we are redefining who gets to answer the question of accountability. All right. Um, yes, and then, and then I'll, I'll, come, I'll come to this side as well. Yes, go ahead. And then we'll get everybody in. Hello, um, so um, my brother is recently um, became a police officer as of last year. He, um, his first day was out on um, New Year's Eve and they just sat him and was like, go. And so um, he, one thing he's constantly coming back and he's working like almost like 10 hours every day and coming back and saying that you almost get punished for being a good officer in that system. Even though he got, um, he got um, connections and were able to be placed in a good area that um, he kind of had to cut down the amount of people he was arresting or stopping or amount of people that he was holding accountable. And he feels like 
it almost feels like as police officers, even being black and brown in these systems, is that you're almost forced to uphold the, um, the systemic issues. Mm -hmm. And I just want to, I just don't understand how there's a way we can push forward. Like I, I truly see that like reform and in the meantime, reform is necessary in trying to get people of our community put in these places of power. But it's almost like there's no one or there's no one outside or inside that's willing to like um, revolutionize the way the power structure is. So, you know, um, what I would say to that is I think George Floyd's death and Tyree Nichols' death um, are examples of that reform, right? We had officer, you know, the, the officers that killed George Floyd was the Rainbow Coalition. The officers that killed Tyree Nichols were all black men, right? That was the manifestation of reform. And so what it shows us is that policing is about violence, right? And that if you don't carry out violence, then you could be in trouble yourself. I think I just saw a case where uh, uh, a female officer tried to... Florida. Yeah, right, in Florida, yeah, tried to right. stop one of her officers from carrying out violence, and he turned on her, right? Mm -hmm. And so I always find it really interesting when it comes to policing. I'll say two quick things. Uh, as uh, public advocate Jumani Williams said, in 2018, we had record lows in crime. Well, the union was still saying, see, crime's down. We need more cops. Crime goes up, crime goes up. We need more cops. So it's never really about public safety. It's about power. Because if, the, because if the argument is we always just need more cops, then why don't we just deputize everyone at age 18 and we have 8.9 million cops in New York City, right? Because if that's their argument, we always just need more cops, why not? The other thing I'll say about power and money is that yesterday morning when I was on my way here, I live off the L train in Brooklyn. Um, the cops hide, you know, and I was on the train and, you know, it was about to pull out. People were trying to get through. The cops were lying in wait to arrest people who came through. So we all had to scream, yo, don't come, don't come, because those cops were waiting there to arrest people, to escalate a situation. Mm. If you don't want people to jump the turnstile, why not just stand at the turnstile? What's with this ticky-tack mm. hide-and-seek nonsense? Mm. Mm. Unless you are there to arrest, to fine, to escalate a situation. So again, it's not about public safety for these cops, for this system. It is about power, money, and who we extract that money from. Because conversely, when I got to 68th Street, Hunter College, one of the richest zip codes, guess where those cops were? Right in front of the turnstile. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Um, there's a question in front here, and then we'll back in around. We'll get to everybody. Hello, I'm a film and media major, and I just wanted to talk about just the important role of film and media with all of these atrocities that are going on, and then just how do we ensure that our voices are able to be heard, because in some southern states, they're proposing that anyone caught videotaping a police officer, making an arrest, it will become a felony. And we all know once somebody has a felony on their record, it affects their housing, it affects the opportunities to get jobs, it just spirals out of control. So I just wanted to kind of hear, you know, the thoughts of how do we, you know, move forward to preserve the ability to be able to capture these atrocities. Another thing, they're, they're criminalizing teaching certain subjects too in some of these states, right? This is criminalizing a lot of behavior that, yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. I think it's important that we tell our own stories. In our stories, our medicine lives, and our stories are our opportunities to resist. It's an opportunity to move beyond a single story. It's an opportunity to, um, to problematize, to make a nuance. Like it's so important that our stories aren't flatlined. There's more available to us. And so thank you for being willing to study and to learn about how to tell stories in ways that um, can uplift our communities, because again, I think it's just so important that we don't get to see just stories about our demise and the death of our children. I think it's important that we see stories that, that answers the question, what's realistic? And I think once we're able to look at these stories, digest these stories, transform these stories, then we're able to um, own that. And there are different organizations where that's a part of their organizing in New York City. Some radical groups have used Cop Watch, where they actually go out and they're looking to film these instances so that, again, it could help 
help in some way so that there can be some way that there could be some kind of, a kind of um, response. So, and I'll, and I'll just say really quickly, it's fascism, right? Because um, that would be, you know, that law, if it gets passed, would be challenged in the courts, probably taken up by the Supreme Court, which mm -hmm. historically maybe would have said that clearly violates one's constitutional right of the First Amendment. But when we look at the courts today, I'm not, you know, so uh, optimistic that they wouldn't uphold something in some of these. So, you know, we have to be very careful of where we see politics going uh, or, or politicians in, in certain uh, uh, circles and in, in, in where, in where we're headed. And we have to be ready to, to fight and resist that. And I don't mean that metaphorically. Mm. A question here. You have a mic coming. Hello. Um, it's less of a question. It's more a comment that you made earlier on. Um, um, the point about trauma porn and um, how um, we're kind of like we're kind of like inundated with tragedy after tragedy, and we're really exposed to it. That resonated with me a lot, um, mainly because of the fact that, at least throughout my life so far, it, it always feels like, um, as someone who is Afro Latino, um, that I have to perpetually be an advocate for myself and for my community, yeah. and that I need to be so intensely informed on what's going on in every every slight little detail what is going on so I can make a proper case to those who will just completely shut themselves out of the situation and not and not and not watch the content which I understand why they don't I understand why they don't watch the content cuz it's graphic but the fact that the fact that I kind of feel like we're being made to have the responsibility of having to watch of having to watch it on a regular basis just so that we can even have the smallest chance at getting our getting basic rights that's i'm not sure if that makes any form of sense Absolutely. but it makes total sense can i say also i'm so glad that you brought up that point because i think that there's even a difference between like even i think we should decouple the word trauma and porn i think it's torture that's an attempt for torture I'm going to make you watch someone's victimization, that, and that it's highly anticipated news. That's profound. Yeah, they, 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 they teed it up for a couple of days. Yes. I remember that, that's right, they did. Because that's not separate from marketing. You must watch TV. That's not separate from must see TV. The, the food that will be sold, the products that will be sold. I have to, I wanna also, you, you made me think about something that's so important because I say this often uh, in my context, that I'd say, it's exhausting being black <laughs> to just, it, because of that point, right? Like you, you constantly feel like we have to advocate for ourselves, have to be present in a room. I say to young students all the time, um, don't en ever enter a room like a question mark, right? Like we have to actually be thoughtful about that, right? Um, and so that self-advocacy is seemingly necessary, but it just seems like there's a constant sort of chipping away at all the other stuff that I could be doing and focusing my attention on. And I don't know if anybody else feels, feels similarly, but. Um, We're constantly made to speak for the whole, yeah, right? right. right? That's right. You know. That's right. Um, yes. Shout out to you. Uh, Yo también soy hondureño, so I, I get that feeling. In fact, you can rarely find a box where it's listing race or ethnicity where it can kind of suffice or it can sufficiently cover. Um, I was curious about framing. So, you know, traffic stops comes to mind and the violence that 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 uh, that, that, that can uh, produce. And how do we frame something um, to institution, to towards legislation, where, to you guys' earlier point about some sense of restorative justice capacity, where the institution feels like there's a takeaway, but obviously the community, the community uh, greatly benefits. And before that that uh, that response, I just want to say, you know, back in May 2020, June 2020, uh, the public advocate and you guys were speaking about the circulation of videos and accountability. And I remember feeling like a lot of the atrocities and examples of police brutality were being circulated at a greater kind of speed than I'm used to seeing. And we know now, in benefit of time, that there's like certain algorithmic buttons that compress that's kind of heightened the, the circulation. But I had also suspected because despite 
Ahmad, Brianna, George, everybody in that in that kind of space and window, that the protests were fairly peaceful, were fairly organized, and the ones that did escalate, um, I was like, is there? It feels like there's like some state agents that are like serving as agitators, and for me it was just kind of like a suspicion at the time. But then Democracy Now just confirmed and just put out a report that indeed that that was happening. In my head, it was like an evolved counterintelligence program, mm -hmm. and now I'm even weary that it's gotten even that it's evolved even further. So I was wanting to mention to the public advocate and to the esteemed uh, folks up here, particularly for the students and us young people who, who take this energy and this experience and seek to do some advocacy or some activism, that we are kind of mindful of that, that we're mindful of that not all the players are proper players and that we have extra vigilance in our approach to social justice. So the original question is uh, traffic stops, framing policy, framing proposals, that some strategies and techniques that will allow better reception on the side that they were proposing it to without having a sacrifice or you know, uh, sell out any of our convictions. Thank you. So I guess I'll start, and I'll start with the second part, then go back to the first part. So, you know, uh, I always find it interesting when it comes to protest and how we always seem to feel that we need to justify the protest in a framework of nonviolence when the state is acting out in violence. Breaking a store window, I don't care. <laughs> it, truly, I don't, right? You know, if, if the state is in the business of taking people's lives and there are some folks in a society who are like, that window needs to come down because that's the voice that I need to let them know that this is serious. You know, that, to me, that, that's, that, that's okay because there are multiple ways to uh, express one's emotions. And also, we have to think about there's various languages that we need to speak. And sometimes the language of violence doesn't hear that nonviolence. And again, that's, you can take that how you want. Back to your first part, part about you know, the framing of, of, of traffic stops. Most traffic stops are, are, are simple violations, right? And so, you know, they, and, 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 and they're violations that then extract money from people, right? So they are not these uh, moments of uh, peril that need to end in someone dying. But we know this going back to the late 90s with Driving Well Black and the study around New Jersey State Police that showed that 97% or so of New Jersey State Police on the Jer New Jersey Turnpike were stopping black men, right? And why, when they started to do the, the research and the, and the kind of back, you know, uh, research back in it, it was because all the training videos had black men in the cars driving with dreadlocks. So, you know, the police, regardless of the, co of the color of the police's skin, was like, oh yeah, I see black, I automatically associate with crime. That's why sometimes whenever you have to do like training videos, you'll see this kind of multi racial uh, uh, amalgamation, and that's because you know, they, they're trying to get away from you only seeing one type of person. But I think we can move away from armed people stopping you. Mm. Uh, I mean, that would be my main thing. And you know, we live in a society with so much surveillance technology, which again might be a different conversation, but uh, a lot of, of those simple violations are already caught on a camera, right? So you know, uh, having someone come to your door, uh, and again, as someone who's a, an advocate of defunding the police, I can still empathize with someone who's walking up to a door with all tinted windows and also might be a little bit fearful for their life too in, in that kind of strange relationship that we've now uh, created because someone rolled through a stop sign at an intersection versus you know not. Um, you know, it's interesting, I know you have a question, when you talk about uh, uh, breaking windows and so on that doesn't bother you, I always tell people that are bothered by that. And I said, well, even Jesus turned over the tables in the temple. Yeah. Uh, that's the Catholic school in me. That's Catholic school. So that's Catholic school in me. Yeah. Uh, uh, first, thank you for coming. Uh, everyone's talked about police. I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about something else, and that's housing. And that's something that affects everyone, white, black, Asian. Uh, uh, one of the alternatives, I don't, they didn't specify which alternatives they were in the city budget, which I think was a problem, wanting to specify things that really cuts down on conflict and criticism. If you leave it, you know, vague, that's just ammunition to attack these things. Uh, one of the uh, 
new alternatives is supportive housing. I support it in theory. I think it's a good solution, but uh, you know, when getting regular public housing uh, and affordable housing built, like the Harlem 145, which mm -hmm. got shot down and it's now a truck depot. I mean, say what you want. I'll take a housing development that adds a ca capacity over a truck depot. Yes, they could have added more, but you know, you have to look at the reality in that it's, it's a private developer, try to get the best out of it, the best deal, and then, you know, make peace. Do you think, uh, do you think that this inability to get regular housing done, affordable housing done, that that contributes to skepticism uh, of supportive housing. You know, you're not being able to get the basics done. What makes you? What, why should someone believe that you can get these more complex, advanced system institutions built? Housing works. Work. Housing works. I think it's it's so important that we're again we're going back to basics. Thank you for bringing that in. I think, again, if, when I think about the traffic stops, I think about public space. Those are contested spaces, where we live, where we grow up, how we navigate the, the neighborhoods that we are in. I think it's, it is really important that, and, and like Jamani Williams said, we have to talk about the solutions that communities are already asking for. So when we think about safety, we think about housing, we think about access, we think about education that reflects who we are. We think about food. We want to make sure that our soil is healthy enough so that it can grow the food that we need to survive. And we're taking into, into account climate justice. So all of these different systems are interconnected. And so it, it, we, we began the conversation talking about policing and murder, and we're connecting it to all of the different aspects of, of what helps, keep, helps to keep us alive and to thrive. Yeah, and I'll just say, give everyone housing. <laughs> like, like, forget the red tape, affordable, clean, safe housing. How can we claim we're the richest country, richest city, all this nonsense, and we have people living in bunks and shelters and in, in, in warehouses? As, I mean, you know, but I'm just talking about what, 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 the, what we do have. Uh, to me, it's, it's, it's grossly irresponsible. Okay, we have uh, one question there, and then the last question here. Oh, and the two more, two more, two oh. quick ones. Uh, so good afternoon, uh, Brother Smichael and, and Dr. Smiley and Ortega Williams. Uh, thank you for hosting this panel. And of course, uh, Hunter for providing the space. Uh, so one, I was sitting here and listening to the conversation and so much of what everyone had to say. And of course, I'm looking at the towering images of the Roosevelt's here. Um, so the, the main question for me, and I, I think leadership and advocacy is very important to me, um, to whom do we advocate? Uh, especially when we think about like the institutions that we talked about, uh, namely, you know, police departments, uh, you know, housing insecurity, institutions that are responsible for committing various kinds of violence, uh, particularly on, on black and brown and low income people. So in light of that, to whom do we advocate is, is my primary question. Yeah, I'll take a little bit of that as well. Um, but before I do that, um, Bianca, we have, one question there, and then the last question will be up front here. But one question back there. And in, in the meantime, I'll answer. I'll take part of your question, which is one of the things, as you mentioned, Roosevelt's, how you doing, brother? Good to see you, man. All right, go. Um, one of the things that I, um, sorry, Cap Alpha Psi, he, he's. <laughs> but we, we welcome all, we welcome all. <laughs> but, um, you know, one of the things that it, when I talk about the Roosevelt's, which is, which is interesting, they have such a fascinating and rich, um, it's, a, it's fascinating, it's rich in thinking through the scope of the policy making that, that, that was the New Deal. That this country really doesn't have the, the political will to do that again. But what's also interesting, because we have to be fair, is that there were very specific provisions of the New Deal that were not for black people. 100%. Intentionally, right? Um, the pressure from um, Southern segregationists was immense and had been for long periods of time. So you have something like the GI Bill, which gave Africa, which gave veterans the opportunity to go back to school. Blacks were excluded. And by the way, even if they were able to go to school, most of the predominantly white institutions they could go to did not take them. Right? 
You had um, other bills that, for, that kept them from joining unions. You had other opportunities where others had opportunities to buy homes in the suburban uh, America, which was, which was growing rapidly at that time, right? African Americans were kept out of that. What is one of the biggest contributors to the wealth disparity, the lack of home ownership in our country, right? So we see that from decades ago, this, this disparity um, not only was, it had been created certainly through slavery, but, but not only what do we see the beginnings of the disparity, but you realize how, the, how substantial and complex the policy making was from the highest levels of government from the highest levels of government, you see the creation of a racial wealth gap, right? And, and every other gap, healthcare, housing, whatever you, whatever you can think of. And when, so when you ask about you know, who to, to whom we should advocate, I would say advocate for, but my mom's an English teacher, can't dangle the preposition, so to whom we advocate. Um, I am a political guy. I believe elections matter. They always matter. The problem is many of us don't vote regularly. There are a lot of other ways that we can tackle this. But when we think about the policies that affect our lives on a day-to-day -day basis, tell the students all the time, most of that happens on a state and local level. Guess where our, our, our low turnout elections are? State and local level. We, president's great, it's sexy, but all of those policies that, you know, healthcare, policing, Criminal justice reform, bail reform, all of those things that we're talking about, those are state level policies. And the, uh, the, turnouts for those, the turnout for those elections is abysmal. And so when we think about change, the first thing you gotta do is get up and vote. The second thing you gotta do is advocate for folks who want to vote, but their rights are being restricted because of laws that are being made. And I will say this, and I, I kind of blame Obama for this, but I don't, it's another whole other conversation about party structures. But during the Obama years, Democrats lost a thousand seats in state legislatures across the country. So all of those legislatures that we're looking at right now for restrictions on uh, voting, uh, opportunities to vote, um, the anti-trans bills that are, the, the, the uh, CRT bills, there are over 500 bills in this country to change, to change curriculum to ban CRT and teaching of some African American history, over 500. And when you look at the scope of it, um, you have to think about the fact that it's state legislatures that are doing this and getting it passed. And if we don't elect the right people, and the right people, if we don't elect the right people who are mindful and conscious of this, um, it's, it's a slippery slope, it's just it's going to continue. Uh, that's my political hat on, so that's why I talk about elections. These, these uh, astute colleagues might have other things to, to add, but elections matter. They always do and always will. Yeah, and I'll just say, you know, sometimes we have to advocate for ourselves, uh, through ourselves, by ourselves. And so the example I always like to use with that is how we think about mutual aid and this kind of reciprocal nature of sharing with others, when, particularly when we have resources that others might need and, and it coming back to us. And the prime example of that is um, if anybody in here who was born after the mid-80s and went to public school and got free breakfast, that didn't start because Ronald Reagan thought that was a great idea. That's that started right. with the Black Panthers, That's right. right? And the Black Panthers did that. And Huey P. Newton said observation leads to participation, mm -hmm. right? So that kind of mutual aid through community organizing is a way to advocate to show, you know, kids need to eat something or need to make sure that they are, you know, well nourished if they're going to go put in an eight hour school day. So I, that would be my answer to that. And I would say also we advocate with institutions that we are we are intimately engaging with. So people are trying to change the child welfare system, which removes children from families. So as a social worker, we think about the policies that we put in place in organizations or within school districts. So it's important that we're also able to um, organize the constituents that would have something to say around those particular issues as well. Um, and also I think it connects to healing. I think we need to not beat people up when they don't vote. I think we also need to make sure that we're responding to why they think that that is a hopeless strategy. That's true. And so That's when true. we're able to deal with the hopelessness, then we're able to then say, okay, so what will a multi-pronged, multi-dimensional strategy look like for us? Yep, that's right. We have two more quick questions. You look back and then we'll come forward. Thank you. 
Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Basil Smigel, Dr. Calvin Smiley, and Dr. Anna Ortega Williams. I think with all these issues brought up, there needs to be real public policy reform. Um, how can my question is how can we have proper checks and balances for police officers if police bosses, like one of them said, um, his brother is being almost like he's feeling punished for being a good police officer. Um, if police bosses themselves, also another police officer I know who was also a, a level boss, had his boss, you know, flag his social security, had to go through many courts, you know, court cases, uh, just because he questioned his boss. How can there be proper checks and balances if the, uh, the police bosses and the system of policing escalates the systematic uh, police brutality and violence on black and brown communities and on, on just escalating the systematic, you know, the systematic issue of what the system plays out to be? So I, I go back to my stance. We have to defund them till they are nothing. Uh, and I mean that quite seriously because abolition doesn't mean that we then live in a, in a state of anarchy. We are still thinking about what public safety looks like. But when we think about the history and the origins of policing in the US South, it comes out of the slave patrols. In the US North, it's out of uh, strike, uh, you know, uh, beating down uh, laborers and, and monitoring immigrants. So there is this virus, I'll say, that, that permeates the roots of policing. So if we want to get away from how do we do all these different things, why don't we get rid of it and replace it with something that has more transparency, um, uh, people who are really in positions not to carry out violence, but to carry out accountability, to carry out uh, restoration, to carry out healing. Um, and again, We've seen the reforms, we've done the body cameras, we've trained them, the bias training, female police officers, uh, uh, they've painted the, the police cars in trans, uh, transgender and LGBTQIA colors. You know who are some of the most affected uh, uh, folks in this city when it comes to sex work? It's LGBT communities that are targeted by police. Bill de Blasio had to get rid of a policy called uh, where uh, p cops were doing the stop question and frisk off of condom, uh, 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 having condoms on them, using that as probable cause to arrest mm -hmm. people on sex work. So this is not, for me, policing is not an organization that we should be striving to save. It's one that we should be trying to eradicate and replacing with something better. That's, that's, that's my goal. Right, is to replace with, you know, imagine if we were sitting here in 1825 and say, you know, let's just give the slaves nine to five jobs and Sundays only half a day of work and stuff like that. That sounds crazy because it's a system that was born in violence. That's what policing is. And if we really want to move away from violence, we have to, we have to move towards uh, uh, systems of healing, systems of accountability, and other systems that, uh, that don't promote beating people to death. Because remember, Joe Biden, once again in his State of the Union, said he's going to pass legislation to stop uh, chokeholds. Tyree Nichols did not die from a chokehold. He, he died from fists to his face and boots to his jaw. Sorry, I got a little passionate there. No, that's right. No, not at all. I think the one thing I would add to that would be also we have to go, again, we need to step back and also think about how do we relate to each other. Like I think about the little girl, black girl Bobby, who was taking pictures of lantern flies right. and trying to get rid of lantern flies. And a neighbor, a white neighbor, also called the police and said, oh, a little black woman was, I was like, she's nine years old. And now she was, she was just recently celebrated for her contributions to scholarship. But until we are able to uproot that. So I think building communities, a way where we're able to say, oh, actually, who's my neighbor? I don't, how are we able to also to challenge racism, anti-black racism at the root, like within our, within our different institutions? I think it's important to, like I look at an organization like the Orgy Lord Project where they thought of a, a strategy called Safe Outside the System. So what are ways that communities are already trying to pr pursue safety that doesn't include hyper surveillance mm -hmm. and reliance? Right. Um, final question. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm a student, by the way, too. Maybe I'll take one of your classes. Uh, but I like to talk about police training in perspective, put it in perspective, 
and then defunding the police. Um, if you want to become a plumber in this country, you need 3,600 hours of training. If you want to become a beautician, you need 3,000. Um, if you want to become a police officer, you need 650. Now, if you want to become a police officer in Finland, you need about 5,500 hours worth of training. Okay, here in the United States, we train you how to use weapons. In other countries, they teach you how to make decisions, how to communicate. Right. Now, why would you want to defund the police if we're so far behind other places in the world who have far fewer deaths when it comes to contacts? Why would you want to do that? So why would I want to defund them? Because they're claiming they're already doing all these things and it's still not working. The, poli the, police, the police go for their gun. They have an arsenal of weapons that are supposedly non-lethal that A, still kill people, and B, they still take out their gun and shoot people. And they, they aim for center mass, right? They're not shooting you in the ankle to take you down. They're shooting you right where all your vital organs are. So I am not of the political persuasion that the system that we have is just going to be retrained into being good cops or, or, or into the system that we want. Because if it was a, if it was a problem of how much money they're getting, how much more can we give them? We give, right here in New York City, over $11 billion to NYPD. That's more than some countries' GDP. How much more, how much more can we give them? I, you know, I, I'm like realistically, should we just, why don't we just give them a trillion dollars, right? With, I mean, like, it starts to sound absurd, but at what point do we have a saturation where they are non-compliant with these changes? And we see that at every step. Patrick Lynch, who's the president of the union, is resistant to every single reform. That man said that Eric Garner didn't die from a chokehold on national television. That's what we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. So, you know, excuse me for being frank, but I just don't see it. I don't have the optimism in the police. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, really thank you for being with us today. My professors, friends, colleagues, thank you so much. I mean, it's accountability, but it's also abolition and it's healing, and let's go forward in that, in healing. Thank you again. Thank you.